Mm. Well, praise the Lord. It is always a humble privilege to stand before you, to break God's word to you. And I feel led, I feel confident that God's word to you is appropriate. Because I've heard the word mentioned this morning so many times. Encouragement. I heard Sister Karen mentioned it. I heard Pastor Jerry mentioned it. I heard Pastor Amar mentioned it. And that's what I want to speak to you about this morning. I want to, I want to help you. The world is heavy. Our lives are burdened. I know if I were to ask you honestly, you would have to say yes. There is lot, there's a lot going on in life to discourage us. Listen to this. A little coat store owned by a, a man up north. He posted up a little notice in his window and it read like this. Let me read it for you. It reads, and I quote, We have been established for over 100 years and we have been pleasing and displeasing customers ever since. We have made money. We have lost money. We have suffered the effects of the Great Depression, of government control, of bad payers. We have been cussed and discussed, messed about, lied to, held up, robbed and swindled. The only reason we stay in business is to see what happens next. <laughs> now that store owner recognized that life was full of difficulties. But he was determined to survive. If only to hope for the best and to see what happens next. You and I, however, we have a greater privilege than that. We serve the risen Christ. We have a much better reason to face the tough times when they come. Because the word of God has promised us that better times are up ahead. In fact, the psalmist reminds us that in spite of the prosperity of the wicked, the, the righteous will be vindicated. And church, I know, like I said, I know there are heavy times. I know that sometimes we feel like our lives are in the pits. We feel like we are in the doldrums. We feel like life has jumped on us with both feet. And we don't know how to get out of the hole we are in. We are ready to throw in the towel. Maybe that's you this morning. You are fainting under the burdens and the trials that are burdening you down. And you do not know how to get up. You feel that there is no way out. Maybe you have came here this morning for a word of encouragement. Maybe you came looking for hope. Maybe you came just for motivation to go on. And I want to tell you this morning, maybe you are feeling hopeless and discouraged and disillusioned, but God's word has a message for you this morning. Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us he has found a secret to stay encouraged in the Lord. And that's my subject to you this morning. How to stay encouraged in the Lord. My team this morning is do not lose heart. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is one of the, the, the chapters in the Bible that I love to come to when I have troubles. For it puts in perspective where I am and how my outlook on life shall be. I believe this word will help us if we will understand it. I'm going to touch on three little verses. The last three verses of that chapter. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. Let us read. For which cause we faint not. For though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, work it for us far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Would you say amen? amen. Verse 16 says... For this cause we faint not. That's an amazing statement. Especially when you realize and understand what Paul's life was. And the troubles he went through. 
The word faint there speaks of a failing of the heart. So we can rephrase that and say, for this cause, we do not lose heart. In fact, the New American Standard phrases it just like that. It says, we do not lose heart. Paul is telling us that whatever comes his way, he does not give up. He does not give in. He does not give up. He does not lose heart. Now, it is easy for you and I to lose heart. Every day, we get downtrodden. We lose heart. But Paul is telling us, whatever comes his way, he does not lose heart. Is he boasting? Is he bragging? I don't think so. I believe he is making a statement of fact. Because Paul has discovered a spiritual secret that you and I have not discovered yet. He knows and he has understand and this secret he has found enables him to be encouraged whatever comes his way. I want to share that secret with you this morning. Now I said we understand Paul's life. We know some of the things. In, spite, in, in fact, in, in light of what he has just said, that he doesn't lose heart. Let me read some of the things that he had to go through. And tell me if you were there, whether you would lose heart or not. In earlier in this same book, in, verse, in chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul had to say, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we disappeared even of our lives. They were scared of their very lives. Later on, in chapter 11, Paul had this to say. Are they ministers of Christ? He was defending his, apost his apostolic ministry. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In death, often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes. Same one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils in water. In perils of robbers. In perils of mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils of the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger and thirst. In fasting often. In cold and in nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh to me upon me daily, the care of the churches. Yet in spite of all these trials and tribulations and burdens, Paul is saying, I never lose heart. I doubt there is anyone in this room who can say that if they were in any kind of troubles like that, they will still be strong and ready to go. I doubt there is anyone here who says, I never get discouraged. I never give up. I am always encouraged and excited by what's going on in my life. If that is you, wave your hand. Bless you, my sisters. We need to be like these sisters. The truth is that most of us here cannot say that because we stumble from discouragement to discouragement daily. We want to quit from time to time. We all want to stop and give up because we feel like we have already given all that we can give. Most of us are like that. Instead of being like Paul, most of us like, are like David. We like to say, oh, that I would spread some wings and fly away like a dove where I could rest. I know, I have been there. I have been there many times and so have you. But while there are times when we would rather fly away, I don't know about you, but I want to be like Paul. I want to find out that secret. I want to be like him. And in spite of all my troubles, I want to say, I do not lose heart. So how do we get there? Pray? Okay. But I want to show you the secret out of God's word here this morning. Notice with me in verse 16, Paul says, for we, for we do not faint, though our outward man perish. How do we get there? You and I lose faith and we, we want to give up because we don't have the correct perspective of who we are. 
on what our lives are. Paul is saying, we do not lose heart because I recognize that the outer man is perishing. You and I don't understand that. The fact is, we don't accept that. We don't think that we are sometimes going to be sick. We don't think that sometimes our bodies are going to ache. You see, our outer man is perishing. That is a fact. The outer man refers to our fleshly bodies. It, it, it talks about our, our body and our mind. And church, the results of aging, of growing older, and the sin in your mind conspire to take away your hope, to take away your peace of mind, to take away your joy. The outer man is perishing. The word perish there means to rot or to ruin, to corrupt, to be destroyed. It is the same word Jesus uses when he says, don't put your money in a bag where moths can eat and corrupt. That word corrupt there is the same word perish. So in other words, our outer man is being corrupted. We need to understand that. Every day the outer man is being destroyed by the pain and the burdens and the trials that come our way. If I were to amplify this verse, let me tell you, let me read to you what it was sung like. Listen. So we do not lose heart, though our outer man, our body, our brain, our lungs, our liver, our heart, our muscles and our bones are wasting away are being destroyed, are being eaten away, are being capsized, are being consumed, and are being wiped out. That's what it means when it says our outer man is perishing, church. I went to the doctor for my medical, my annual medical. The doctor says, well, your blood work came back, your bad cholesterol is a little high, your triglycerides are a little high, your sugar level a little high, but all of that is okay. How are you feeling otherwise? <laughs> and I said, Doc, well, I don't see very well. I have to use my glasses for everything. She said, mm hmm. I said, I don't hear very well either. My wife is constantly telling me, turn down the volume in the TV. She said, mm hmm. I said, when I climb the stairs, my knees hurt. She said, mm-hmm. I said, when I wake up in the morning, my back aches sometimes. She said, mm-hmm. I said, all of that, all you're saying, mm -hmm. She said, yeah, because it comes with the territory. <laughs> I said, what do you mean it comes? She said, you have to understand, it's all part of growing older. <laughs> and suddenly, this verse came to me. The outer man is perishing. It all made sense. What the Bible tells me here, my doctor is confirming. My outer man is perishing. And you see, you need to understand that. The, the word of God tells us that the whole natural world is under the curse because of sin. You need to understand that the outer man is perishing because of your fallen nature. Romans says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but we ourselves also. We are groaning under the pain. And let me remind you, church, God does not save his children all at one time. Now, don't misunderstand me. We are saved. We are blessed. We are delivered from our sins through what Christ did for us at the cross. When you come to him in faith and repentance, he eternally saves you from the penalty of sin. But that does not mean that you are free from corruption and death. Too many of us lose heart because we have not come to the understanding of that. Everyone in this room, saved or not, is going to waste away and die. This is the promise of the word according to Hebrews. It is appointed unto man once to die. We will waste away and we will die. We may die of old age and slip away into eternity. We will may die as a child or as a young adult. We might have a sudden heart attack. We might get cancer and waste away slowly. We may be consumed by Alzheimer's. We might die suddenly in a car wreck. We may be struck by even lightning. I want to tell you, church, we may leave this earth in any of 
thousand ways, but we will die because the outer man is perishing. As if to further explain it, Paul says earlier in, in the same chapter, in verse 7, he says, we have this treasure in earthen, earthen vessels. We are living, church, in fragile jars of clay. One day, that jar is going to crack. One day, it will break and we will fade away. That is the nature of life. Our outer man is perishing because of our fallen nature. A second reason our outer man is perishing is because of fallen people. If the fallen nature doesn't get you, I have to tell you fallen people will. <laughs> you see, it is a foolishness of man, of a man, a fallen man that causes him to drive his car drunk and kill another person. It is the foolishness of fallen man that causes him to strap himself with bombs and go onto a bus or into a mall and kill other people. It is the fallen nature of, that let us down every day. Fallen people hurt our feelings. Fallen people cause us to, 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 to get burdened down. They hurt us physically and verbally, emotionally and spiritually. That's what Paul was saying. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not despair. We are persecuted, but not, for, not for, uh, forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. That's what Paul was talking about. Fallen people caused him to get there easy to lose heart when life and people turn against you. But God's word to you this morning is, you do not have to lose heart. Paul learned the secret, and he shares it with us here. You don't have to be defeated, church. You don't have to become a statistic. You don't have to be someone who used to walk with the Lord. You don't have to be someone who used to come to church. You can reach where Paul reached this morning. You don't have to lose heart. So how do we get there? The answer is that we maintain a proper perspective. You see, what I need, what you need, is to come to that place where Paul met, uh, found himself. I want to reach that place. I want to reach that place where I can say, I do not faint. I will not lose heart. You see, I want to come to the place where even though I'm attacked from outside by fallen men, or attacked from inside by my fallen nature, I can say like Paul, I do not lose heart. And this text helps us. So the secret to not losing heart is found in the next two verses, verses 17 and 18. And it involves three realizations that I want to bring to you this morning. The first Paul says, we do not lose heart, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul is saying we are given fresh strength for every day. He reminds us that though our outward man is perishing, the inner man is being renewed every day. We are perishing daily. Our bodies are wasting away and we are getting closer and closer to the grave. But we can all, and while we can all relate to that, I want to tell you that our inward man is being renewed every day. Every day, the inner man is given new strength to face the troubles of the day. Every day, God from heaven is giving you a new unction on life so you can face the troubles of the day. Jesus said, take no, therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient is the day of the de evil thereof. You see, while every day brings its own unique problem, church, every day also comes with a fresh, a fresh amount of grace for you and I. Lamentations, Jeremiah said it this way. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed, because his passions fail not. One of my favorite choruses is, is, is a, a, a song that goes, I was asking Karen if she knew it. We sing it so often, I love to sing it. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning, great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, great is thy 
I prayed for me. You need to understand that truth. New mercies God sends to you every morning. The inner man has been renewed and renovated every day. But we need to understand, church. God in Christ has provided a fountain. And he says, come and drink. But I want to tell you, while that fountain can renovate you and refresh you, the key word there is day by day. You need to do it every day. You see, your life is like a spiritual car. It is not meant to run on yesterday's gas. You need to fill up every day. Your spiritual metabolism cannot survive on yesterday's meals. You need to eat a fresh meal every day. The spiritual dosage of healing that you got yesterday is not going to be sufficient for your heart today. You have to have a fresh dose for every new ailment. Our buckets leak. The grace we bought up from the fountain yesterday leaks out as the day goes by. Tomorrow morning, we need to go and draw fresh. You have to draw fresh food and fresh fuel and fresh medicine. So you say, Brother Mickey, what does that mean? It means, church, that you have to feed on the word of God every day. It means, church, that you need to pray to the Father every day. It means, church, that you need to have fellowship with the saints every day. It means, church, that you cannot come to church once a week or once a month. That is not going to do. You need a fresh supply every day. Is it any wonder that we lose hearts so easily when we take care of everything else in our lives? But the most important thing, we don't. We feed our bodies and our bodies are perishing. We take care of our cars, we change the gas, we put oil in the, in, in the car. But the cars are perishing. We go to the doctor and we take our medicines and we take care of our bodies, but our bodies are perishing. Yet we make so little preparation to take care of the most important thing in our lives, which is our relationship with the Lord. You need fresh food, fresh fuel, fresh medicine. Day by day. The fountain is available, but you need to draw out for yourself every day. Amen? The second reason, in verse 4 and in verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, Work it for us far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. The second, the second thing Paul tells us is that nothing we face in life will last forever. He says our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Let's examine that for a minute. You know why? Because when troubles come, that's not how it feels, does it? It doesn't feel light. It doesn't feel easy. Paul says that the pressure he is under is easy. But we recall the verse before when he said, we would not have you, brethren, ignorant of our troubles. We were pressed even unto death. In that verse, he was telling us he was despairing of death. But here he comes and tells us that the burdens are easy and light. Let's understand it. They are light and they are easy. Why? Because he points out they are for moment. We think when our troubles come that we will never get out from under them. Paul is saying that the problems of life that seem heavy right now, the troubles that seem like if they will never end, the burdens that you think is going to break you under its weight, they are really weighty, but just for a moment. Perspective change. You need to get to that place where you understand, yes, it's happening. Yes, the troubles are here. Yes, the trials are here. But they are not going to last forever. Why? Because he tells us that compared to the little trials and the little troubles we have here, it doesn't compare to the eternal glory that we will inherit when we arrive home in heaven. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the eternal glory which we will enjoy with God. You see, nothing we face here will be worthy to be compared to what we will see there. But here's the problem, church. 
We hear this, but we don't believe it. We only believe in what we see. We believe in what we feel. We believe in the pressure we face now. We think it is never going to be easy. How often have you heard a, a, a believer get up and testify and say, I have troubles, but they are light and they are easy. You don't hear that. You know why? Because we have our eyes here and now. But Paul had his eyes there and then. If you are going to get right perspective, you need to get like and start believing and thinking like Paul. Don't just see your troubles here and be surrounded by them and let them burn you down. Take your eyes off the den the here now and put it on the den and there. The troubles are going to come. Yes, you cannot change that. But you can. Don't have to lose heart. In verse 18, Paul reveals a secret for losing heart when life tries to kill you. He says that things in this world are temporal. It is merely for a short time and it will pass away. But we don't see that. We don't dwell on that. We dwell on the troubles that are right here and we don't understand that the things that are in heaven that are ours are going to be eternal. Here we will groan. We don't understand. We will groan for a few days here. But there we will have everlasting joy. Here we will feel pain for a short time. But there we will forever experience God's glory. We pain may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. Perspective church. You need to get a good understanding. A right understanding of what life is all about. Maintain a proper perspective. That's how Moses made it. God called him out of, of a, la, a foreign land and said, Go, I'm sending you. You don't even know where. But the word of God tells us that Moses looked for us. Abraham looked for a city that was, had foundations whose builder and maker was God. When Moses was forced to leave Egypt, the word of God says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured a seeing him who is invisible. That's how Stephen made it. He was being stoned to death, but looking into heaven, the word of God tells us he saw the face of Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. That's how Peter made it. That's how Paul made it. That's how Joseph made it. That's how Abraham and Isaac and all his sons. Did it. And that's how you and I are going to make a church. If we would take our eyes off the here and now and place them on the then and there. Hallelujah. Compared to the joys of eternity, your little troubles here are going to seem like nothing. Nothing. Thirdly, in the last part of verse 17, Paul tells us, for our troubles work it for us. Hmm, you say, what? Our troubles are working for us? How is that, Brother Mickey? Well, you see, when things happen to us, we wonder, how is something so painful and tragic, how a, something so senseless could mean anything. But Paul says it does. I told you I had occasion to speak to Sister Rita a couple of weeks ago when her husband suffered that massive heart attack and she was telling me, Brother Mick, I don't know what is happening. Daddy has a stroke and he's lying on a bed helpless. Mommy is blind in both eyes. She can't do anything. My husband lost his job a few months ago. Now he suffers a heart attack. And in his a guy in his language, he says, I don't know what we do. <laughs> she couldn't understand what she had done. And I had to tell her, sister, it's nothing that you have done. Nothing that happens to you is meaningless, child of God. If you are a Christian, nothing that happens to you is meaningless. Everything that takes part place in your life is part of your father's plan to make you his child. Everything. Some of us are lost because we don't know why. And I want to remind you why. That God did not save you to make you happy. He did not save you to make you blessed. Those are just byproducts of your salvation. God saved you so that he can make you like his son. That is God's eternal purpose. We like to quote 
Romans 8, 20, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to this purpose. For them for whom did he, he, if he did not know, he also predestined. And this is the part we don't, we don't read. To be conformed to the image of his son. God saved you so that he can make you like his son. So hear me, church. When cancer comes and wastes away your life, it is not meaningless. When a drunk driver runs into somebody or your, your loved one's car and your loved one dies, that is not meaningless. When you lose some loved one to some sickness or disease, it is not meaningless. Pastor, when you struggle with problems in the ministry, it is not meaningless. Parents, when you struggle with the decisions of your children, they are not meaningless. When the tragedies of life pile upon you one after another and you feel like you cannot get out, it is not meaningless. Far be from it, the word of God says, these things are working for us. Working for you. Far exceeding an eternal weight of glory. How, you ask me, how is it working for you? Because it causes you to be patient. Because it causes you to pray more. Because it causes you to depend on God more. Because it causes you to get closer to God. They are working for you. Perspective, church. Understand. You do not have to lose heart. We lose heart because we do not understand. Paul is saying you do not have to lose heart. All of the things that are happening to you. You can be like me. You too can say, I do not lose heart. Why? Because I understand the outer man is perishing. But I know that the inner man is being renewed. Because I understand trials that come. But I know that they are working for me. Because I understand that nothing that happens in my life is meaningless. So let's make some applications here. How do we lose heart? How do we not lose heart? We recognize and we understand that our outer man is perishing. You could slow it down some, but you can't stop it. It's going to happen. You're going to get old and you're going to die. So say it simply. Your organs are going to fail and you're going to die. Accept it. It is going to happen. No matter how godly you are, you are going to get sick. Because our bodies are wasting away. Our organs are failing day by day. Day by day the outer man is perishing. But we can stand tall in the knowledge that our inner man is being renewed. Recognize that. Understand it. And renew your mind every day. Preach to yourself. All week I was preaching this message to myself, man. In the bedroom when I'm sleeping at night, when I get up in the morning, I'm preaching this message to myself. I spent time in the entire chapter. We look back with me to, 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 to verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may, of God may be in us. Understand that you are living life in an earthen jar. It is going to break one day. God is doing what you, what he did in his son going to conform you to his son's image. Preach that to yourself every day. The only way that people is going to see the light that is inside of you is for your jar to be broken. Yeah, yeah. Jesus said, you don't light a candle and put it under a bushel where nobody can see the light. Your jar is going to be broken if people is going to see your light. Preach that truth to yourself. Verse 14 reminds us that God has a plan in all of this. He will see you through the storms of life and he's going to bring you home safe and to glory. Preach that to yourself every day. Verse 15 reminds us that everything is lie in this life is for the glory of God. Understand that. Life is not all about you and what you think and what you want. God has a hand in everything that you do. Life is about God and bringing glory to God. Preach that to yourself every day. Verse 16 and 18 tells us, 16 and 18, the ones we use, we are challenged to get our eyes off this world and its sin and its problems. We are told to look beyond and look to the heavens. That is where you are going, church. In that coming world, 
the cares of this, this life will seem nothing as compared to the glory we will have there. Preach that to yourself every day. Live life in the truth of who you are in a Christ, as a Christian. You are just a pilgrim passing through. You are on your way to a different land. You are just a person passing through this world on your way to your home. Along the way, you are going to become delusioned and defeated and dejected at times. But you do not have to lose heart. Because God is going to help you. He is going to strengthen you. And He's going to bring you home safe and in His glory. If you will keep your eyes on Him and not on your situation and your trial. That's how you stay encouraged in the Lord. You get into the word and you understand the perspective of where you are. Yes, you are a human. You live in a fallen world. You have a fallen nature. You're surrounded by fallen people. They will disappoint you. They will do you all kinds of wrong. But you do not have to lose heart because this is not your eternal home. We are on our way to a land of glory. Be encouraged in the Lord, church. Don't lose heart. Stay focused in the word of God. Too many of us lose heart because we don't do that. We are not drawing strength from God's word every day. You feel like you're ready to give up? Don't give up. God's word to you is that you do not have to lose heart. Would you say amen with me? Amen. amen. Thank you for listening. And I pray that God's word will be rich in your heart this coming week. to yourself do not lose heart because you're not saved he's talking about temporary condition that we face and there's a better life beyond we who are saved we have a hope that regardless of what is happening to us I remember when I was young when I was a little little boy and things were rough and your parents are not rich and you didn't have many things and our consolation was Jesus will come one day. We will go to heaven one day. We used to console ourselves sometimes with the thought of heaven. And we can do that now. But you are not saved this morning. You cannot console yourself with the thought of heaven. You will lose heart when the pressures of life come upon you. I want to invite you today to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. You don't have to lose heart. It doesn't matter. He